I'm, I'm perfectly fine. Hello, welcome to Sad and Fairy Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Today I am doing a book review of Stars and Bones by Gareth L. Powell, which is a book coming out next month in 2022. It's a sci-fi from Titan Books. So I received this book from NetGalley in exchange for a fair review. Thank you to Titan Books for the ERC. I really appreciate it. <laughs> there are no spoilers in this review. So Stars and Bones is an exciting and fast-paced space opera about humanity escaping a menacing force that turns out to be not what you think. So what's this book about? 75 years from today, the human race has been cast from a dying earth to wander the stars in a vast fleet of arcs, each shaped by its inhabitants into a diverse and fascinating new environment with its own rules and eccentricities. When her sister disappears while responding to a mysterious alien distress call, Aaron insists on being part of the crew sent to look for her. What she discovers on Candidate 623 is both terrifying and deadly. When the threat follows her back to the fleet and people start dying, she is tasked with seeking out a legendary recluse who may just hold the key to humanity's survival. So I really enjoyed this book in that it was very easy to read, it moves at a very quick pace, everything is easy to picture and envision, and I liked the small twist at the end with the antagonist. There are elements of modern and classic sci-fi, including a touch of horror, that I really enjoyed. The novel has generational ships, space travel, an apocalypse kind of, sapient AI, and aliens, amongst other things. It reminded me a lot of different sci-fi movies at different points in the novel, but it didn't feel like a mishmash of illusions kind of roped together. It felt like its own entity, and it was really really fun. <laughs> I did enjoy it. I think it would make a really cool movie actually. But there are some things about it that kept me from like loving it. The novel moves too fast at times and I sometimes had to stop myself from trying to figure out whether something was plausible. For example, when extracting all the humans from Earth, what about those indigenous tribes in the Amazon that rarely see other humans or like the Mennonites and the Amish who reject technology? Like, were these people just taken from everything they know and thrust onto these spaceships? Like, did they get a choice? Like, they obviously weren't the ones destroying the Earth, so maybe they can stay. You know, the novel touches on dissenters, so these are like arcs that don't like being on the arc ships. But this idea, which was really intriguing to me, actually didn't get enough focus. I was like, oh, that is actually really cool. Like, how would this work? How would their society function? That kind of thing. And we get a little bit into it, like, about capitalism and things like that but not enough that I felt like I really understood the dynamics between the ships and how they functioned with one another. While I really liked what the nefarious entity that's killing everyone ended up being, the ending was a little too kind of like cerebral for me. I'm not going to spoil it obviously but the concept is just not one of my favorites. I mean I've seen this before this kind of scenario and it's just not something that I find particularly interesting. I also thought the solution to the problem had a bit of a deus ex machina um, aspect. I don't mind a bit of deus ex to be honest like I don't, usually don't care but this one was a bit much and kind of too obvious in its revelation and build up. I was kind of like oh yeah okay that's gonna happen and it didn't I'm like, all right <laughs> one thing I thought was interesting was how the book made me consider what life means if we're not on our planet scotch whiskey you know which the main character drinks a few times requires a certain terror to get the flavor for example when I was in Belgium years and years ago um I went to we went to this brewery and they showed us how they make the beer there it was like a carbonated beer it was really interesting I didn't particularly actually enjoy it but I mean it was really interesting to see and so they took us up to like the rafters of the building and that's where they had all the vats for the fermented beer to to to, to for, for the beer to ferment in and the like cobwebbiness and like old beams and things of the building were what gave the beer its distinctive flavor and that's terror and that's and scotch very much depends on this as well so <laughs> i mean this is a long winded explanation but maybe i'm wrong but would a printer be able to synthesize it properly like if so is it is it still scotch I'm not saying the book should have answered this at all, but it raises an intriguing question about authenticity that it made me think. So I thought that was actually quite nice. The novel brings up the ship of Theseus argument, but I don't think that applies to this particular example because you're not slowly replacing the ingredients of scotch over time, but you're making a copy of something. Yet how would a 3D printer create the flavors that come from a peat bog, for example? Most scotches need at least five years in the barrel. So is the synthesizer creating the liquid and then putting it in a barrel? Was the barrel, like was the was the barrel and oftentimes there are different kinds of barrels like there's like a like a cherry or cherry sherry barrels for example they'll, they'll distill the scotch in those particular old used barrels like is the 3d printer creating these barrels too <laughs> like 
I, I don't know, maybe it can, but does that ruin the, you know, specialness of it? <laughs> or is 3D printing a luxury, you know, is 3D printing a luxury item like Scotch a way to level the playing field for people that can't afford it? And does that ruin it? Anyway, I think that this is a very complicated question and I find it very fascinating. And I did like that the book kind of made me think of these things. It obviously didn't provide the answer because I don't know if you can, but uh, I just thought it was interesting that that kind of came to mind. <laughs> Now, one thing I wasn't very fond of in the novel is the idea of talking cats and dogs. The novel has this idea that you put this collar on the dog and then it can talk, or the cat, and then it can talk to you. I mean, it was cute, but we saw that in Up. And I also don't know if it worked, like, it also didn't work for me. I bet some readers loved it and th that's fine. I just, it was like, just for me, I was kind of like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Also, the idea of, like, their idea of, like, warp travel or whatever, um, they call it substrate, reminded me of the movie Lost in Space, the crappy 90s one. I watched that movie quite a bit when I was, like, 13. Uh, I loved it when I was 13. I think I had a weird crush on Gary Oldman, which is awkward, because he's he was, like, 30 years older than me. Um, <laughs> anyway, um yeah so their explanation of traveling at warp speed or hyperspace um reminded me of that movie <laughs> there are also some other things i think need some fact checking in the book for example like armor piercing rounds don't leave fist size holes in walls as walls aren't bodies they don't contain the same sort of viscera and flexible material like organs and blood and things like that that a bullet trajectory takes with it to create an exit wound in a human so a bullet hitting wall just makes a bullet hole because there's more resistance and less material pulled with the bullet especially given how close she was to firing at the wall it's not like she was firing it from a long way back she was pretty close and armor piercing rounds are designed to get through stuff they're not hollow points intended to make a big hole so I don't know that just was like seemed like a kind of an editing error <laughs> Overall, unfortunately, while I did find the story entertaining, it is a bit forgettable. The characters aren't very deep, and while their motivations are clear, I can't say I found them overly interesting. Some characters had promise, like Tessa with her dissension views, but are only given one chapter for their point of view, and others, like the cop character, felt unnecessary. It also seems like Aaron, despite only being a pilot, is given a lot of control and responsibility over the fate of humanity when there are supercomputer AIs who are charged with protecting the human population that could make more informed choices than her <laughs> I think the reason though overall why you know I didn't love the book even though I did enjoy it is because the story doesn't take a breath to deep to delve deep into the characters whether by playing them off one another or letting them ruminate so while they aren't flat they could have used some more layering for example I wasn't sure why Aaron is hesitant to engage in a relationship with one of the other characters and the depth of certain characters reactions to other people's deaths wasn't very hard-hitting like some people die and I'm just like Okay. Then again, this is a very quick, short, action-driven story. It's like a movie versus a, a series. We sometimes have to remember that we're spoiled now with the media we get. Due to series, we're given such depth to each character that when we get a standalone or a short book, we forget that we can't possibly get that same depth without losing the pace of the novel or the movie. As such, the book can entertain me. I enjoyed the twist at the end. There's nothing distressing in it, really. And it was fun. So if you're looking for a fast, fun space opera with an interesting take on aliens, this will definitely hit the mark. I recommend it for people who like 90s action sci-fi like Event Horizon. <laughs> or that lost in space movie or the new show which I really like even though it's like for children <laughs> I absolutely love that I've watched all three seasons I forced my husband to watch it with me and I mean I mean he didn't hate it but I he did not like it as much as I did I was like oh my god I love this and he's like yeah anyway um I recommend the lost in space show if you have like eight-year-olds and want to get them into sci-fi but you don't want to show them alien yet though I mean I watched alien when I was eight and I'm I'm perfectly fine <laughs> thanks for watching